Last week, Commissioner of the Environment and Sustainable Development, Jerry DeMarco, tabled in the House of Commons, reports that demonstrate three decades of federal government commitments to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in Canada have yielded an increase of more than 20% since 1990. We're definitely going in the wrong direction. So to talk about that report, I'm going to discuss this with uh, Professor Matt Hoffman, political science uh, professor and co-director, Environmental Governments Lab at the University of Toronto. Welcome to the interview, Matt. Thanks for having me. Look, this was a sobering set of reports. We're going to talk about the, the first one, the overview, I guess, uh, the lessons learned from 30 years of climate change challenges and opportunities in Canada. What's your take on it? Well, there wasn't a lot new here. This is some people that have been following climate politics in Canada have been have been saying similar things to this for, for a while, that Canada has been very good at making promises, making commitments, making announcements, and not very good at following up. And this, is a, this isn't a partisan issue. This is something that liberal governments and conservative governments have had real difficulty doing, moving beyond that stage of making announcements about climate goals, climate targets, climate action. Um, and I mean, what's great about this report is it lays out uh, things that can be done moving forward. And I think that that's, that's important. Uh, a lot of the, it, there's not a lot of radical things in there in terms of what can be done moving forward, but there's solid ideas about what should be done both sort of within the government and then what the government should be doing uh, to, to break this cycle of announcements followed up by very little action. Now, Commissioner DeMarco uh, has described eight uh, areas of concern. And the first one is stronger leadership and coordination. And I guess uh, stronger lead, your point about making promises and never doing anything to act upon them uh, is the first place that we uh, need to look for stronger leadership. Yeah, and that's, it's, uh, look, it's easy to make announcements. And the, the real work of putting together a climate plan is the, is the hard part. And I'll give the, the current government its credit where it's due is the, the plans that they have now, if they're implemented, are, are pretty good. Um, they're not sufficient, um, but almost no country's plans are sufficient. Um, but they are pretty good. And so then the question is implementation. And, and one of the things that I've found interesting in that report is that part of leadership is shifting how the government approaches climate change. And they made a couple of points in the report about needing to essentially what we would call mainstreaming climate change within the cabinet, right? And making it not, making climate change be something that all cabinet members uh, see as central to their roles rather than it being what the the ministry of environment and climate change does right and i think we started to make some progress around mainstreaming i mean i think it's interesting that the former environment minister is now natural resources and so i think that that's been one sort of disconnect that we've seen in the past where environment and natural resources are and ministries that are at odds. I mean, not, not sort of openly, but they have different mandates and mandates that go in different directions. Well, let's talk about that for a moment. I mean, one of the, the issues uh, in a decentralized federation like Canada is that the provincial governments bear a lot of responsibility for implementing climate policy. There's limits to what the federal government can do. And currently, uh, BC and Quebec have uh, actual climate plans with targets and policies and so on. Many governments don't. Uh, Alberta had a plan and then the current government got rid of it. Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Ont um, Ontario and the Ford government is, uh, is a real foot dragger, a laggard on climate policy. The maritime uh, provinces aren't uh, that great. So how do we resolve, you know, for the federal government to provide stronger leadership, it has to resolve that issue. What, any suggestions or observations on that? Yeah, if, if I knew how to solve the provincial federal uh, relationship around climate change, uh, I don't know. What, I don't know if that would be making me rich, but it certainly would uh, uh, make me uh, smarter than I am. 
Um, it's the key relationship, right? Especially given how much of how many files that are related to climate change fall under provincial jurisdiction. Um, one thing that the, the report focused on was uh, the need to depolarize climate change. And I think that this could have, this is the, this is the key to unlocking provincial federal um, friction. I'm not sure that the federal government can depolarize climate change, but this has to come from multiple directions, right? This has, we have to get to a point where regional, especially sort of provincially based conservative parties don't see climate change as an existential, climate action as an existential threat to their, to their policy platforms, to their existence. Um, and I don't entirely know how we get there, but it, it's, I mean, there, there's, suggestions in the report around education and, and independent commissions and things along these lines. And I think that those are, are gonna be important. Um, but to me, that's really part of the key to unlocking this provincial federal deadlock in some of these areas is to make it not a partisan political issue. Now, another point that Commissioner DeMarco made was that Canada's economy is still dependent on mission intensive sectors. And that, for me, had a big red flashing uh, arrow pointing at Alberta and Saskatchewan, where you have uh, the oil and gas industry is, is centered. And uh, oil and gas in Canada is responsible for 26% of national emissions. So all, as I've made a point in many columns, all roads to decarbonization run through Alberta at some point. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I, I don't know how we fix this. I mean, we're a big oil and gas producing nation. Any thoughts? Yeah, well, I think the first thought is once, I mean, the cliche once, if you're in a hole, stop digging, right? And I think that to me, what this means is fossil fuel subsidy reform has to happen very quickly, right? We know that in a decarbonized world, the Alberta economy can't be so dependent on fossil energy extraction, right? We know, so we know the end point. And so then the key is, what do you start to do now? And I think that you start to send strong signals that the government is not gonna financially support the industry moving forward. And simultaneously, you signal by what you do with the funds that are, fro that are freed up by doing this, that the government is gonna support the province and communities um, in the province that are dependent on fossil energy and the people that are dependent on the fossil sectors through no fault of their own, um, through moving those resources into helping and starting to diversify the economy, right? And I think that this is a sort of key aspect of what many people talk about as a just transition where you support through monetarily, through education, through a number of number of methods, you support those that are adversely affected, not only by climate change, but by climate action. And, and I think that this is going to be, it's not going to happen overnight. But I think that if you start to send the signals that the government is not going to provide long term support for that sector, and you move the support that it's been giving that sector into other areas to develop help the help communities and provinces move in a different direction, that's what, that's what needs to happen quickly. Now, another point that Commissioner DeMarco made was that increasing public awareness of the climate challenge is a key lever for progress. And public awareness is an interesting uh, term because very often it's interpreted as uh, uh, literacy, like energy literacy, for instance. And I disagree with that. Uh, I think uh, you, the public is only has a very limited capacity to understand technical issues like energy and climate. I mean, these are very technical. And, but they do respond well to narrative. And they do respond to the, well to stories that support that narrative. So a new narrative might be, you know, the energy transition is a tremendous opportunity for investment and job creation, you know, as the global energy system restructures, you know, it's not, we're, we're not just avoiding climate disaster, we're actually laying the foundation for new prosperity for Canada. 
that kind of hope and optimism narrative, it seems to me, is something that Canadians would respond to and are responding to it. And uh, anyway, th that's my thought. What's what's your take? Yeah, I agree 100% on that. I think that um, Canadians are aware of climate change. The awareness isn't the issue. And can Canadians are even concerned about it. And so I think that concern isn't even the issue. The issue is, and I think that you're right around narratives, that I think that what public awareness needs to focus on, and this is something the government can do in terms of having its convening power, is we have to start having a global conversation around what's the good life in a decarbonized world? And how do we live that good life? And how does, how does that good life become both more sustainable, but more equitable for larger parts of, and hopefully for everyone in Canadian society? And that's how you start to build sort of political constituency for transition. We have to, the kind of transformation that we need is gonna take a significant political support from broad swaths of the public. And I think that the way you start to develop that is helping people have the conversation so that they can see how they're gonna live the good life through the transition and in the low carbon future. Yeah, I, I would agree. And another point that uh, Commissioner DeMarco made is that climate change is an intergenerational crisis with a rapidly closing window for action. And I made the point in columns and, and in, uh, in interviews that energy transitions go really slow for a couple of, uh, or three decades, then they go really fast for about maybe a decade, a decade and a half. It's the disruptive decade of that transition. We're in it. This is the 2020s. This is, and we see it all over the place. You know, automobiles, batteries, uh, power sector, it's all being disrupted by new technologies, new policies. But we don't have forever to adapt. The, the window that, that we want to talk about a closing window, you, you know, China, uh, Europe, uh, the United States are all investing in the new clean energy economy. And by 2030, a lot of those opportunities are, being, are going to be gone. I mean, we don't get on it. We're going to miss. We're going to miss the the boat. And uh, so there's a, another angle to that. Again, what's your take? Yeah, I agree. I think that the and one of the keys is that this disruption is going to happen without planning. And and I think you talk about technological disruption. I'm seeing very similar things in the sort of financial sector where the fin financial large capital is moving rapidly. And large capital moves rapidly without any concern for what kind of disruption it leaves in its wake necessarily, right? And so we're gonna have technological disruption, we're having financial disruption. And I think that this is the kind of stuff we need to plan for so that people can see um, the, the good life through this area era of disruption. And I think the federal government can play a, a key role in that, both in terms of resources, but also in terms of narrative. And I think that it's absolutely imperative that we get ahead of this, or at least stay on par with that. And that is about how the government signals what kind of investments should be made, what kind of investments they actually make, and the kind of conversations that, uh, that they convene with the Canadian public. Uh, a final point that uh, Commissioner DeMarco makes that I want to talk about, enhanced collaboration among all actors is needed to find climate solutions. And I've had a couple of experts that I've interviewed recently who made really interesting points. And that is, if you're going to have enhanced collaboration, if you're going to have these, you know, these new conversations, you need an institutional framework within which to have it. And we're not really great at that in Canada, you know, creating the, those institutions where, where we can have the conversations maybe between the provinces and the, the federal government or between industries, uh, between concerned citizens, maybe civil society. Again, what's your take? Yeah, well, I'm not a, a total expert on climate, pol I mean, Canadian politics, uh, but I agree that we don't have a, we don't have a lot of these institutional frameworks in place. I think some of we've had in the past on some environment and economy roundtables, and I think that those those could be brought back. I think that we can look other other countries have them, so there are models available. Um, the Danes have a great model of collaboration between academia, industry, and government at multiple levels. Right? They call it the triple helix, 
And this is a this is a model that I think could be could be replicated. Um, I think part of this, though, is part and parcel of depolarizing climate politics, right? So places that have these good institutional frameworks for collaboration across types of actors and, and governmental levels have reached a place where they're not arguing about whether to take action on climate change. They're, argue, they're arguing and trying to figure out how. And unfortunately, not in we haven't reached that place in Canada nationwide yet. I think we've made some progress this the last federal election. Finally, now the Conservative Party is not fighting against climate plans and have put forward their, their own. And I think that as, if that continues, if we're not dealing with climate change as an existential political issue between parties, partisan, existential partisan issue, rather an existential public issue, then I think we'll, it'll be, we will rapidly start to develop some of those institutional frameworks. Matt, I always appreciate your insights. Thank you very much for this. Yeah, thanks for having me. Great conversation.